Hello and welcome to The Rejection Diaries, Season 3, Episode 2. Today we're going to be discussing all that goes into pressing send on your work and then putting it out there into the world for, for agents. And it could also be for other things like competitions or via your agent to publishers or whatever medium you happen to be sending your, your work to. Now, before we start, I, I always like to, to try and start with a bit of context to, to everything before I get into the specifics. And press and send on your work is a very difficult thing to do. It's it's something, and I'll talk a little bit about this later on, but it's something that has a, a neurological effect upon you. It, it certainly has an emotional impact upon you as well, and that's obviously you know, all linked. And so one statement I'm going to say now, and I'll, I'll come back to it later on, is that sending your work out there can be really hard. It is really hard. But, well, for me anyway, it's one of the bravest things you can do. Writing a, a novel, finishing a novel, and then sending it out there is is quite a remarkable thing. And I think that for, for anyone who has done that or is planning to do that, um, just know that you're, you're doing great just getting the work out there because obviously if, if you don't put it out there then nobody's going to come come knocking at your door uh, seeking out your your genius or your, your brilliant story and um, that's not how it works unfortunately and in, in this in most industries you have to put yourself out there you have to put your work out there and say okay maybe nothing will come of it but unless it lands in that person's inbox then it's definitely not going to come to anything. So that's something that's well worth considering if you're on the hesitant side, um, if you're a, a bit of a, a JD Salinger and you like to write your manuscripts but then just keep them in a drawer and not send them out. Uh, it's well worth putting out there and, and, and taking taking the risk. Uh, I think the, the, the risk-reward ratio is, <laughs> is probably not as high as we'd like it to be, but it is definitely worth um, giving it a go. I think. So we're going to talk about press and send today. Um, now, you know that this is a bit of a, a, a live rejection journey and we're going to be following or, or mirroring my, my own journey while discussing the, the various aspects of it. So in, in episode one there, we, we spoke about um, preparing for submission. So the things you do in, in the build up to it in the, in the few weeks before it to try and get um, everything into the best possible shape in advance. And we spoke about um, you know getting other people to read your work, getting beta readers. Um, you know if you if you have the means, booking agent one to ones to get expertise from them, or you know private uh, developmental editors, or whatever you whatever you can manage to get. And 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 one thing I probably didn't emphasize enough last time was that um, if you don't have the means for these things, often organisations will will offer them for those who are on lower income and, and don't have. The means to to book it themselves so it's well worth looking that up as well within within each organization i think pretty much everyone does that um if you're if you look closely enough on the website and you can you can email uh, the, the people involved to to sort that out but as a an alternative to even all of that uh, getting a good critique partner or critique group which you, you can set up you know you can you can just put a tweet out there and, and say i am writing uh, middle grade sci-fi is anyone else writing in a similar space um, and would like to swap some chapters now or whatever that you know sometimes that can be um, just as fruitful as some of the uh, the other um, financially laden routes that you can take as well to get feedback so in advance then of pressing send on your work so you've got a polished manuscript you've got a cover letter that's going to stand out from that pile of uh, 400 a week other cover letters I hope um, and if, if you haven't that's obviously an area to work upon because uh, the, the general vibe I get from agents is that determines hugely for them whether they're actually going to open the document with the pages and whether they, they're going to consider okay I if I'm going to take this person on as a client I need to be able to pitch this um, to the sales team at X publisher so it's not just about the the commissioning editor, the the you know the editorial person who who might love the book and say, oh, this is brilliant, you know, blah blah. 
um, and they take it to the acquisitions meeting and the salesperson says, yeah, but I just can't see how I'm selling that. And and that's so so key in, in your letter as well as to say, okay, put yourself in the position of that salesperson at the publisher. How can you pitch this book so that even they will say, well, actually, it, there's a very clear market for this book. The pitch um, is exciting enough that it will stand out and it's unique enough against the thousands of other books that are published and will be in the similar space. And that's that's so important. So yeah, if you're if you're working on your cover letter just now, uh, that's just worth bearing in mind. And obviously, you need to the majority of agents anyway uh, need you to send a synopsis. So working on that and just making sure it's as succinct and clear as possible. I think the the biggest bit of feedback I get on a synopsis is to simplify. I I I'm terrible for this personally. I. I often go for very complex, over-wieldy plots that have lots of strands to them. And uh, sometimes, in fact, almost all the time, I'm told, could you just simplify that story, You know, streamline it? What is the main thing that's happening? And you don't necessarily need to go on of all the secondary uh, characters and plots and so on and just uh, distill it down to the, the key message and theme and, and the heart of your story. And if you can do that, then your synopsis will do its job. So you've got all those together and you're feeling confident and ready uh, to press send. You'll also have at this stage, hopefully, have looked up all the agents which represent both your age category and your genre. And you'll have maybe, if you're like me, you'll have made a, a spreadsheet. Um, we'll, we'll talk about spreadsheets again shortly. And you'll have listed all of those um, th those agents. For me, initially, when I started um to, to look for agents, I'd, I couldn't find many that were especially keen for, for sci-fi. There was a lot that um, maybe said, oh, I, I you know, they don't uh, preclude it or they don't, um, you know, they don't hate it or, or whatever. Or some, uh, quite a few of them say they don't mind fa fantasy and sci-fi, but as long as it's on the lighter side and so on. So, you know, it's, 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 it's a judgment call, I guess, whether you, you include those who um, may be on the edge of being appropriate or not. Um, ultimately, you know, I, f I found uh, six that seemed really keen. Uh, another person uh, who someone recommended to me via a tweet I put out on Twitter, and it's always worth um, asking people um, for recommendations like that because you often get ones that, oh, I didn't think of them um, or I didn't know about them. You know, they're maybe quite new and um, it's, it's w well worthwhile doing that. And I got a nice response to that, which was good. Um, and then through going through the entire list of agents that you can send a, a, a middle grade book to, as, as, as in my case, or whatever the, your particular age category is, you will find that actually that person, if I look properly through their list, they do have a couple of maybe light sci-fi authors or um, authors who, who write about like time travel adventures or, or something similar. And you think, well, actually, they're not totally closed off to that, um, hopefully. And as long as they don't um, exclusively say, do not send me uh, X, Y, or Z, whatever your genre is, then I think it's probably um, okay to, to to send it to them. I think um, for me, me personally, and I know not um, everyone subscribes to this, but I, I, I do like to be quite targeted and, and send to all the agents that I think I'd like to work with and who'd be interested in my manuscript at the same time. And there's a few reasons for that. And I talked a lot about this last week, actually, in the in the previous episode, and we were talking about uh, different strategies that you can use. And for me, certainly, just sending them all at the same time, it seems like the fairest thing to do, i.e., I imagine I get a, a request, you know, not likely, but it, <laughs> it might well happen. And then you're, you're sort of scrambling to then email agents that you hadn't emailed initially, because you're now in that sort of, you know, race against time, you know, like the request in a fool, they might read it quickly, they might offer you rep and you still haven't emailed a lot of the agents you want to work with and so on. So that that's just my point of view. I'm just going to email them all at once. And then if something good comes, then at least they've all been in, you know, the same time frame in terms of consideration, um, which I know is, is a massive thing for agents. You know, so many of them have to drop out of these, uh, multi-offer situations because they just don't have the time to abandon all their other work 
which of course takes priority and takes up the majority of their time over submission pile reading and they just won't get it done by the whatever deadline it is without dropping the ball on you know like a foreign rights deal for one of their current clients which you know which makes sense you you'd want that if you were the client uh, that they weren't dropping the ball for a potential um new client from the submission pile so all of these things are factors and that that's why i do what i do um and and think about yeah okay these are all the ones i'm going to send to it and i'll just i'll just do it in, in, in one go so for me personally i did that yesterday i, I press send yesterday um, and we'll talk a bit more about <laughs> the actual act of sending in a second um but one of the the, the important points about um building up to press and send as as well not just getting the submission package and your list of agents and all of their specific instructions uh, which you should read carefully and you should follow to the to the letter don't think ah but yeah but i think if i do it this way it'll be a bit you know a bit more cool and, and out there and whatever just <laughs> stick to the to the instructions as as closely as you can if there's if there's wiggle room to do i don't know whatever it is you want to include then then fair fair game um i'm all for experimentation and trying new things but yeah they've got the instructions for a reason and and sometimes i guess they they might just not read those that don't follow the instructions so uh, for me anyway do do what they tell you to do so yeah mentally preparing yourself for sending this out that is um that's a whole uh season in its own i talked about that in season one of uh, the rejection diaries about ways to sort of mentally preserve yourself through throughout this process both before during and after and and there's lots of sort of help there i looked up a lot of resources to to hopefully give you some of the tools that you need to to help you throughout that but one of the things that i i think is important is to encapsulate the process a little bit not to allow it to be this unwieldy spiraling tangential uh, process that could last six, 12 months that consumes your life, that you, you view as, you know, your your only chance, you know, you're putting all those eggs into that one basket. I think trying to pull yourself back and away from that is important. And and as I say, that's why I do the sending all to the agents at once, because now that I've done that, that's it. I can wipe my, my mind clear of that and I can move on and, and you know, come what may, like whatever the, the process finishes like for me at least uh, I've done everything I need to do now and I, I just remember with some of my early books you know sending out a few queries at a time and I would wait for those to come back and in, in the interim because I was waiting and hadn't sent to all the other agents and so on I, I just felt like it was an incomplete process and I, I, I didn't have the mental capacity to to move on to another book or on to um, spending my spare time just like reading or you know taking uh, care of my physical health or, or anything else like that because um, it became quite all-consuming and what ended up happening with with a couple of those books is you know my querying process would take the best part of six 12 months because of sending some and waiting sending some and waiting and so on and and that wasn't good and, and it also a lack of productivity which um, escalated uh, some of the the feelings, the negative feelings I had then about both the the process, the industry, and writing itself, which you know should be something that we just love, regardless of all this outcome based stuff. So, for me anyway, mentally approaching uh, querying this time, and I've basically put like querying into a, a little bubble, and I'm not going to allow it. To, <laughs> I'm going to try not to allow it to 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 burst out of that bubble and to start spiraling into. You know, taking over other aspects of my life. Um, and we'll we'll talk a little bit more about uh, what what specifically I'm doing to help me with that later on. Okay, so we are at the stage now where I've got all the sub package. I've got my list of agents. I've got all the the draft emails composed. Um, I always do the draft emails to all the agents. Um, before before I even put their email address into the the send box, that's important because it's so easy to hit send by mistake or hit the enter key, which which does press send, uh, before you have uh, double checked through the letter, before you have attached the right documents for that particular agent and, and so on. So I always do them as drafts first without going near the actual email address of the um, the agent and, and get everything in place. And as I say, then it helps me to, to send them all out 
sort of the, 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 um, in, in one go rather than uh, sending one and then starting a second one and sitting there for two, three hours, you know, sort of toiling over that, then sending that and then sitting. Like, and, and what end up ha- ends up happening is the whole process takes a week, two weeks, three weeks because you're just doing a little bit at a time. Um, again, this is this is obviously linked to to my own uh, neurological uh, pathways and the way that I think about things and the way I organise my life and uh, my processes and so on. But um, I think it's in terms of efficiency, in terms of giving you that opportunity as well. If you if you write the draft email and then just leave it for a bit and go and do some other ones, and then when you finally come back to that one, you're more likely to to spot the issues or uh, to see actually, you know. When I did ex agents uh, personalized letter, I, you know, I went into more detail about this and this, and um, maybe I should do that with them as well, you know. And it gives you a chance to sort of cross check that. Whereas if you do one at a time, send one, at a time, you get to the third one, you went, you suddenly say, oh no, I've forgotten to say this in the first two letters, and you know, it's it's obviously too late to retrieve it at that point. So that's why I do the process that I do when I'm I'm sending it out. So uh, the emails are sitting, fully composed, all the attachments. And they're in the, the draft folder ready to go. Now, a funny thing happened to me yesterday when I got to this stage. Uh, I, sorry, it was on Friday. It was on Friday night I got to this stage. And I sat there and went, okay, I'm going to sleep on it, which is a sensible thing to do. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm actually not usually as sensible as that. Uh, <laughs> I would usually probably just, uh, you know, try and get it all done on Friday night and send. But I was, I was, I don't know, in some sort of... Um, some sort of clarity came over me and I decided to, to wait. Anyway, I slept on it. I uh, got up yesterday morning and I considered, okay, um, this is sort of, you know, you get one go at this. You don't you don't get several shots at say, sending the same novel out to, to agents and so on. So I spent a bit of time going through it all again, even though I'd already checked it. Um, yeah, doing, doing <laughs> a, a variety of checking, but mostly just sitting and looking at my screen and, and not pressing send. And I, I don't know what happened. I, I Some sort of anxiety took over me. Um, I panicked. Uh, I sort of paused on the, the precipice of, of send for, for some reason. And I just waited and waited and waited. And, you know, I, I messaged a, a few friends on Twitter just uh, <laughs> hoping that they would give me a bit of encouragement and say, yeah, go, you know, hit send and so on. And eventually, I, I did get there, um, and I, I pressed uh, send on them all. And when I did it, I I got a bit restless, and I was wondering about my living room for a while. And my wife was like, what, "What's wrong? What's wrong with you? What are you doing just now?" And yeah, of course, I just I was having that 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 sort of post press send panic. I think that um, probably. I think all of you will, will be able to relate to if you've sent work out before. Uh, but once I got over that and I logically told myself, yes, I've done everything I can. It's my very best work. Um, it's a story that I want to tell, uh, you know, and I, I, yeah, I can't do any more. Once I got to that stage, I was at peace with it and uh, I was able to to walk away and, you know, and, until obviously I started thinking about things this morning for the podcast I didn't think too much more about that. What I did do, though, <laughs> of course, is is go onto Twitter and send a, a tweet about it, um, which is where I, I sort of u- uses my sort of unconscious unraveling of my thoughts. That's the place where it all goes. So, um, you guys get get treated to that on a regular basis. Um, but then, uh, then I said, okay, what am I going to do the rest of the day? Because I had a bit of a spare time yesterday, and I opened up. Uh, an, an outline that I've been working on for another novel and spent the, the rest of the evening on that and you know worked on it pretty steadily last night uh, and actually I think I might be good to go on, on drafting that today um, and the good thing about it is that I'm so I'm, I'm very 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 excited about this uh, particular novel and you know there's nothing like that uh, start of novel uh, buzz before you start writing because y- you know that it's full of all those endless possibilities, isn't it? You haven't got the words down yet, and so it could it could go anywhere. Um, but you know, particularly that that you know, it's a YA sci-fi I'm doing this time, and uh, dual narrative, a uh, couple of uh, quite funky characters. 
and so I'm 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 quite excited about it. Um, get to put a little weird voice into to both perspectives as well, um, which you know won't be too relatable to to people living on Earth, but uh, that's the nature of the of the, uh, the the genre sometimes. But yeah, anyway, I, I I like to write down um as well as the outline, I like to write down a, a short opening for for both voices. Um, call I call them voice journals that I, I don't other people might call them different names, but it's just good to sort of get both your characters uh, sitting down at the start of the story and just unconsciously uh, type away in, in their voice. Um, it's good to get a sense of that before you actually begin uh, writing the novel. So anyway, that's what I'm going to be working on now. And that's how, when I spoke earlier on about putting myself in that sort of querying bubble, um, Astra, Firestar and the Ripples of Time, that's the novel I've just sent, that is now in a bubble. And it's a bubble that I'm tr- going to try not to, <laughs> to pierce and to burst. Um, well, at all, hopefully. Hopefully I just move on and, and that's it. Um, I may or may not hear anything at all from the agents. I think my last novel was about 50% didn't email back at all, um, which was understandable. They were very busy, especially busy at that point. And those you know who did email back, I had a couple of them sort of say, oh, you know, I quite like this and this and this. And, but nobody ultimately who was that interested in taking it on. So I'm, I'm not under any illusions that um, there's going to be positive or good news about this. But um, I just wanted to share my thoughts and my processes as we go through all of this. So the way it begins, <laughs> and I'm not, um, or I'm trying not to prescribe to those sort of classical old uh, ways of of waiting. You know, that's ingrained in us that we must sit there and press refresh and wait and wait. And for these people who are really busy doing other stuff, not reading their submissions, uh, to to eventually come to your submission and you know, in the off chance they like it, to email you back. Uh, I guess you know, like that, that 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 way, I think leads to to a place that we don't want to go. So you know, just because that's that's how it's always been, you know, as waiting on agents and so on, that doesn't mean to say uh, it needs to be the way. <laughs> God, I sound like I sound like the Mandalorian, don't I? You know, the Mandalorian. This is the way. Uh, this is not necessarily the way uh, for us writers. Uh, I'm going to try and not think of it as a way for them to get back to me but more as a, a fixed timeline. So I'm setting a new goal to try and finish the first draft of the next novel within the next three months, which is the the maximum response time given to me on all the agents that I queried. And, and if I can get the first draft finished by the end of those three months, if we get to that point and I'm disappointed and I haven't heard anything or it's just been sort of form rejections from everyone, at least I've got a first draft of something new, something else to get excited about and to then work towards uh, developing that novel and, and getting it ready to to send out. I don't know later in the year or next year, or whenever it's ready. At least you're you know once you get a first draft down, you feel like you're well into the the next one. And the last one just doesn't sting as much, even if you do get the rejections. And it's a, a lesson that I wish that I had learned at the very start of my querying journey, which is why I'm sharing it. And I'm hoping that others will will be able to at least try and initiate it into their own process and cycle and therefore have a healthier approach to querying and and move on to and I know like and I apologize I know that some of you have written a book and it's the only book you want to write and it's the book of your heart and and you know when everyone rejects it um you don't really want to write anything else and and I understand that and if you don't want to that's fine but I guess if you want to be a career author you know, someone who who writes a book, it gets published and then writes the next book and it gets published and so on. This is the cycle that that they go through as well, and so they, you know they don't they don't write one book and then sit there and wait for the the full you know shebang of two to three years uh, from sending it to to the agent to getting published. They don't just sit and wait, you know, for the outcome of that. They've just got to get on with the next the next work and then on with the next work and then on with the next work and and so on. And of course, some of some of the people, the novelists I know, uh, seem to somehow produce two or three novels a year um, remarkably with their uh, productivity. Some of them with, with jobs and stuff, you know, proper jobs on top of all that. So, um, and, and I say proper jobs, I don't mean that writing's not a proper job. What I mean is that they have uh, got a job that, that pays them well and, and, and gives them, a, you know, gives them a, a pension and, and, and all those other things that um, 
full time salary jobs do uh, with writing. I guess you you sort of you you you're freelance, aren't you? You're just getting paid um, some money every so often, depending on how well your book sells, and it's not quite the 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 regular job that that many people have. So yeah, so I think that that's the that's the cycle we have to get used to, it. and I think if you get used to it at this stage, it means that if one day you know you never know we might some of us might sign with an agent we might get a book deal it may well happen for us and all of the practice that we're putting in just now will help us and put us in better stead when we we get to that stage i know again of a few friends who who are published or who who got published with um one of their first books maybe their first book and they get a two book deal or a three book deal or a five book deal and suddenly you know, that first book, which was amazing and it's done really well and so on, they're suddenly saying, okay, <laughs> crikey, I have to write book two now. But book one was the book of my heart. It was, you know, I put everything into that and I don't know if I can do book two and so on. Um, and because they got signed so early in the, in that sort of cycle, they they haven't yet built up the the neural wiring to, to, to move on and just go on to the next project. And so, as I say that, I think that's a definitely a strength to be able to, to do that at this stage before you even get an agent and then if, if it does happen for you eventually fingers crossed for everyone you're then at a, a good position i think to 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 launch forward in your career and to produce books at um fairly regular intervals and and maybe meet the deadlines that the publishers give you um i'm just laughing because you know a number of my friends um you know they, they talk about their deadlines in a similar way they're sort of like oh it's coming up oh i better get 50,000 words written in three weeks and they, they they usually get it done but um that's that's the the published life isn't it working to deadlines and so on whereas for for people like me and, and some of you we just got all the time in the world we can uh we can do things however we like at this stage and I suppose we should try and enjoy that more rather than uh thinking too much about not being published or, or the rejections or the things that aren't going well for us trying to put a positive spin on that <laughs> um so yeah this is all well and good you know we've set ourselves a goal finish the first draft at the end of the three months that helps us once we press send to move on but i also set myself the goal for example at the start of this year to make sure i exercise quite intensely three times a week and um let's just say <laughs> let's just say not all goals get met or get met as well as you'd like them to so yeah, the less said about that particular goal, the better. But I, I do hope I can I can commit to the the first draft and, and get it done in that time. I will I will keep you appraised of my my progress. So um, while I'm waiting, shall I fret? Shall I worry about it? Shall I should I get anxious? Should I daydream? Should I hope? I I guess probably you know the, we can't control our, our our very hopeful minds. I think hope is a a powerful emotion that keeps us going at times when when things seem bleak and and I don't think it's something we should entirely crush or um extinguish from our consciousness I think it's it's good that it's in there however as I said at the very start I'm I'm not I'm not going in with expectation there might be a degree of hope there but but no expectation and I I guess that's probably the the best balance to have um will I be checking my emails more than usual yeah, probably. Um, it's, it's one of those things, again, where, you know, you get a spare two minutes uh, at work. It's like break time. You know, I'm in the classroom alone. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably check my emails and, and see um, anyone has got back to me with fairly regular uh, regularity over the next few months. But I, again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and, and be a bit more disciplined. I know there's a few apps that you can put in your phone where you can lock certain... Um, features like your email uh, for certain hours of the day so I might I might try that and we'll see how see how that goes <laughs> I'll be I'll be unlocking it within minutes I'm sure but yeah we're, we're trying or I'm trying and, and I hope that maybe you'll try this too um to change my neurochemistry about uh, and my outlook on on querying and how as much as we all want to be told our story is wonderful and that kids will love it and that an agent thinks they can sell it and you know and all those other things that come with it that would be wonderful and and it's what we all hope for we also want to feel like 
the time and energy investment we've put into writing the book, spending a year doing that. We want to feel that that's worth it because it's a lot of time to spend away from you know my my wife and my my children who who are growing up and are going through a great period and I love uh, spending time with. It's it's a, it's a lot to take yourself away from that and sit in you know a separate room for a, an hour a day or two hours a day or whatever however long you spend on on your writing and and other various things and that and and reading and and all the other things that you have to do to be to be a good writer and so you want to feel that that's worth it all that time and energy that you've invested into it and and and, you know for some people they they invest money into it too and um you know that's something certainly that that i've done in the past and i i want to feel like that will one day have a a, an outcome to it that's something that will that's and i don't just mean i I don't mean a financial out you know I, i understand that the finances of being a writer and so on and there's no expectation there that um you know even if i had a book published at some point that that would lead to that becoming like a sort of a viable livable career for me um i also enjoy you know teaching probably too much to completely give it up so i i think that you, you want to feel like all of these these little sacrifices you make are are, are going to be worth it on some level and so that's, I guess, hope r- remains. And you, you do want um, someone to get back to you and say, I think your work is brilliant, et cetera, et cetera. But all that said, I do think, and this is probably one of the most emphatic points that I want to make chatting today. And that is, we should be writing our stories for the, the love of the, the actual process of writing stories rather than valuing you know, the time spent on it or the money or the energy spent on it on the basis of the outcomes. Because if we only do that, then 99.999% out of 100, it's not going to be worth it for most of us. And people just give up because you're not going to get a return on all that time, energy, etc. So you've got to love the process. And, and that's something I, I you know, in, in my head over the last couple of years, I've got better at. Is just saying, okay, it's process, process, process. I'm going to get better at the process. It's like, I guess, like uh, me learning to go and you know play tennis um, down the road at a club. You know, I'd have to put in time and energy, probably a bit of money to pay, you know, buy equipment um, to get a membership at you know the club or whatever. Um, if I wanted to get much better, I'd probably have to pay for a coach, etc. But I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing that to suddenly show up at Wimbledon and, and take on Djokovic. <laughs> You know that that's not that's not why I would take it up. I would take it up to um, get an enjoyment and sense of fulfillment out of, of of learning a new skill and getting good at it. And there's obviously the, the the other you know health benefits to it as well, both physically and mentally and so on. And I think for me, writing it, it can be a huge mental therapeutic benefit. And and so we have to look at the the writing a bit more like that, you know, a bit like learning to play tennis or learning to play uh, golf or learning to play, you know, whatever it happens to be, whatever floats your boat. And that's that's what we're investing our time, money, and energy into. And when you look at it that way, it suddenly seems just a bit more fun and like something you want to do and spend your time on, rather than this thing that you're chained to the desk for and the very very tiny hope that you will one day be published in that's an uncontrollable outcome and that way madness certainly lies so I don't think it's worth chasing so I'm gonna finish on a a slightly uh, more positive note hopefully a bit more um, encouraging note for all of you that are listening so whether you're sending your work out right now like me like I'm doing um, to, to agents or to competitions or you sent it last month or last year or even if you're sending it out over the next few months one thing I can say with absolute certainty in a world where absolutely nothing is certain at all, of course, or in, in an industry, for example, is that writing something, um, finishing it, polishing it, making it the very best that it can be in, in your ability, in your opinion, then sending it out to other people is definitely something that all of us should be proud of, come what may. So thanks to everyone for listening to this second episode of season three of the Rejection Diaries. We were discussing today about press and send, the the mental prep, 
uh, the, the physical prep and obviously the ways in which we uh, try to cope with that post hitting the enter key and pressing send. Hopefully you'll join me next time. Thanks everyone. Take care for now and may the force be with you.